Scott, it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Peter Glick. He is an internationally known expert on water resources. He holds a BS in Engineering and Applied Sciences from Yale and an MS and PhD from the Energy Resources Group of the University of California, Berkeley. He is also a MacArthur Fellow and has been elected to the National Academy of Sciences. Until recently, he was the president of the Pacific Institute for Studies in Development, Environment, and Security, a water resources think tank located in Oakland, which he founded in 1967. Currently, he continues at the Pacific Institute as chief scientist. His honors and recognitions are numerous, including the Ven Te Chow Award from the International Water Resources Association, the United States Water Prize from the U.S. Water Alliance, the Carl Sagan Prize for Science Popularization from Wonderfest, and just this year, the Boris Mintz Institute Prize, and I quote, to an exceptional individual who has devoted his or her research and academic life to the solution of a strategic global challenge. He is also a Skeptical alumnus, one of his brighter lights, obviously, having spoken at our second Skeptical in 2011. A program favorite that year, his talk this year will, I am sure, again, inform and inspire us. Please welcome Peter Glick as he tells us about the beacon of science in a fact-free fog. Peter? Thank you, Jean. Well, good, good morning, everyone. Maybe down a little bit. I can hear myself really well. I don't know if you can hear me. Um, I'm delighted to be back at Skeptical. Uh, my experience here has always been wonderful. It's a wonderful group of people. Uh, you made it early in the morning, for which I thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk about this issue of science in what really, for me, is sort of an unusual time uh, where fact and reality is being challenged in somewhat unusual ways, ways that I think even those of us who have participated in Skeptical maybe weren't completely prepared for. Um, I'm going to talk about the role of science in public policy. Uh, I think very strongly that good policy without good science and good analysis is at best unlikely. Uh, I would go further and argue that good science, good policy with bad science is even more unlikely, as perhaps we're seeing around the world today. Uh, there's also a long history of the misuse and abuse of science for policy, but just in the public arena in general. Uh, and I believe that recognizing bad science and fighting against bad science and abuses of science can help keep good science front and center when we make policy. Uh, when we make decisions about things that are important to us. I'm going to talk about logical fallacies. I'm going to talk about abuses of the scientific process. I'm going to talk about the concept of uncertainty and skepticism in the role of public policy. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the internet and social media dynamics these days, uh, which has added a whole new dimension to this question of abuse of science or potentially the positive role of science in policy making. So basically, uh, logical fallacies are a pattern of reasoning that is always or commonly wrong due to a flaw in the structure of the argument that renders that argument invalid. And there are many, many different kinds of logical fallacies. There are arguments from ignorance, there are arguments from error, there are arguments from misinterpretation, arguments from ideology that can be personal belief or incredulity or tradition, arguments from consensus, arguments from appeal to authority, and many, many others. And, and I'm sure you've experienced a lot of these. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some of these in a little more detail. So the first is arguments from ignorance. Uh, this is a Scott Adams cartoon. I'll read it. It says, <laughs> Uh, Dilbert is about to go on a date with, uh, with someone, and she says, I collect crystals. And he thinks to himself, uh-oh. And she says, I don't know of any scientific evidence that they can heal, and he's relieved at that. And then she says, but it's my point of view that they do. And Dilbert, in his fashion, 
can't keep this to himself, and he says, when did ignorance become a point of view? Now, that's a great cartoon. I love it. I've shown it many, many times. It's a little ironic for those of us who actually know Scott, Dilbert, uh, Scott Adams um, and, and his point of view, perhaps from ignorance, about climate change and perhaps some other things. But it's a wonderful cartoon. So that's argument from ignorance. Argument from error. We all make mistakes. Uh, this is a cartoon, an old cartoon from the New Yorker magazine. It's a bunch of white male scientists sitting around staring at a blackboard scribbled with things and one of them is saying, say, I think I know where we went wrong. Isn't eight times seven 56? <laughs> so we make mistakes and errors get involved in, in our decisions and sometimes we make arguments that are simply wrong because we've made an error somewhere. Arguments for misinterpretation. This is a fantastic new photograph. It came out about a month ago. It's from the Chinese satellite that, that uh, was launched to the moon and then landed, a, put a lander, on, a lander on the far side of the moon. It's, it's a beautiful photograph, but if you didn't know what it was, you would think, gee, look at this gigantic planet, dead planet, with this wonderful little moon circling it that looks like it's blue and it has lots of life on it. So, we misinterpret things sometimes based on an incomplete understanding of what we're looking at. Now, those of us looking at this understand what we're seeing, but there are plenty of cases where often we misinterpret things because our perception, our perspective may not be correct. Arguments from ideology. These are also unfortunately very common. They're often rooted in religion, uh, Galileo versus the church was a religious argument from ideology. Uh, Lysenkoism, modern literalists, creationism, intelligent design. Climate denial may not be an argument from religion, although maybe, uh, but it's certainly uh, an argument from ideology, and there are many kinds of ideology that play into this kind of logical fallacy. Another classic one is arguments from consensus. So an argument from consensus is an argument that something is right simply because a very large group of people believe that it's right. The consensus, and the consensus can be wrong. But I want you to be careful because there's an argument going on now in the climate community that climate change is real because it's the consensus of scientists that it's real. And some climate deniers say that's an argument from consensus, therefore it's wrong. So I want you to think about this as a double-edged sword. Is climate change a very serious problem because more than 97% of climate scientists believe that it is? No, that's backwards. Climate change is a very serious problem because the evidence has convinced a majority of climate scientists that it is. It could still be wrong. Any time you have a consensus doesn't mean something is necessarily true. The consensus is not what gives power to the conclusion. For the climate case, it's the science that drives the consensus. And so the, the converse of the argument from consensus, oh, before I do that. So this is the classic PowerPoint slide that you can never read. I put it up there for a reason. This is a list of all, almost all, many of the professional scientific societies around the world that accept the scientific findings around climate change. And it's in alphabetical order, and it goes from the American Academy of Pediatrics through the European Academy of Science and Arts and the European Federation of Geologists all the way to the World Meteorological Association. Plus, I would note, every single National Academy of Science on the planet. So, I actually have a column that describes the, the statements from every one of these professional scientific organizations that describes their, their opinion about the science of climate change. And that's the consensus about climate change. But the converse of that, of course, is the argument against consensus. Whenever there is a consensus in the scientific community, we have to be careful to argue against it. As I said earlier, just because there's a consensus doesn't mean that something is right. But when there is a scientific consensus, there is a pretty clear argument that you have to be, have a pretty strong case when you argue against it. 
And Laplace made this statement centuries ago, the weight of evidence for an extraordinary claim must be proportioned to its strangeness. So if you're going to argue for something against a consensus, your argument must be pretty strong to make that argument against consensus. David Hume said this in the philosophy of science, a wise man therefore proportions his belief to the evidence. And of course, Carl Sagan's classic statement, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Another logical fallacy is the appeal to authorities not competent to address an issue. Um, I, I don't believe in something, so I'm going to ask somebody else who is a higher authority to refute that. And this is a cartoon. This is George Bush from the George Bush era. Uh, after he's received the National Academy of Sciences report on climate change, can we appeal this to the Supreme Court? Well, you can appeal certain things to the Supreme Court, but not something like this. So there are lots of examples of this. Um, the sort of a current one is the arguments against vaccinations. Uh, that's often an argument from ideology. Sometimes it's an argument from personal belief. Sometimes it's an argument from ignorance about the science, about what we understand about the risks and benefits of vaccination. Sometimes it's an argument from error. Uh, this again is a cartoon from the New Yorker this year. Uh, uh, it's a little boy with measles. You can see the little red spots and the doctor is telling his parents, if you connect the measles, it spells out, my parents are idiots. <laughs> so there are other types of abuse of science as well. And there are many types of abuse of science. There's appeals to emotion or ad hominem attacks uh, uh, against the person, against the scientist. There are straw man arguments. There are misuse of facts or selective choice of facts or cherry picking, and I'll talk, each, I'll talk about some of these in a little more detail. There's misuse of uncertainty, and I'll talk about the role of uncertainty in scientific thinking and policy making. There are inappropriate generalizations. There's manipulation of the scientific process. There's bullying of scientists. So let me touch on a couple of these. Appeals to emotion or ad hominem and personal attacks. These are distressingly, for those of us scientists who are in some of these policy debates, very common. That is, attacks against not the facts or the science, but attacks against the person. Uh, this is a quote from 1995 from one of California's congressmen. Uh, Global warming is, quote, unproven at best and liberal claptrap at worst. So, liberal claptrap. He's speaking to a particular audience for whom liberal is uh, an attack, and that's the way he's phrasing that. Uh, Senator James Inhofe, another one of our wonderful uh, federal representatives from the great state of Oklahoma. Global warming is, quote, the greatest hoax ever perpetrated on the American people. And of course, we've seen that word hoax attributed to climate change by many people. Uh, Al Gore. Uh, important spokesman on climate issues. Al Gore can't be trusted on climate change because he lives in energy intensive lifestyle. So this is an interesting mix. Um, I suspect Al Gore lives an energy intensive lifestyle. Many of us live an energy intensive lifestyle. But that's completely independent of whether or not the science of climate change is correct or not. Uh, and so the idea that you can point out that somebody is doing something that you consider to be hypocritical, perhaps, to an argument that person might be making is still not relevant to whether or not the science is true. Scientists have ideologies. They are politicized. This is from uh, a Republican um, strategist, Peggy Noonan, in the Wall Street Journal uh, many years ago. And it's part of a broader effort, in my opinion, to stigmatize science, to say if we, we can't trust scientists in general, Therefore, we're not going to listen to them when we discuss public policy. Uh, another issue, suppression of information or misuse of, of data, uh, uh, selective choice of data, or typically, as we call it, cherry picking data. This may be the most common form of abuse of science. And I'm going to give you some examples, again, from the climate area. I'm a climate scientist in part by training. I should have maybe said that, which is why many of my examples are from the climate debate. And I'm going to talk about something we call the hiatus. 
or some people call the hiatus. I'm going to talk about the issue of global ice in the Arctic and Antarctic as examples used for, of cherry picking. So the first one is this, this issue of global surface temperatures. Global surface temperatures go up and they go down. We have hot days, we have cold days, we have hot seasons, we have cold seasons. Uh, there's enormous variability in weather and day-to-day in uh, day-to-day -day weather. So this is a graph that shows from 1997 to 2008 global average temperatures, surface temperatures. And when you look at this trend, the, the human eye always likes to look at, at graphs and try and draw trends. Uh, there are a lot of different things that you can see. So the trend you get, the trend you see, partly depends on the data you choose to look at. And if you look at 1998 to 2008, there's a trend, and it's decreasing. Temperatures seem to be going down. Of course, if you look at 97 to 2008, temperatures seem to be going up. If you look at 1999 to 2008, temperatures seem to be going up. So this is sort of a, you can sort of see what happens when you cherry pick data. You can get an answer that you prefer. Of course, the world didn't stop in 2008. This is to 2010. And of course, it didn't stop then either. This is the same global surface temperature index from 1880 to 2018. And there, that little green line that you can see is that, that first one, 98 to 2008, showing a decrease in temperature. So around this time, from 2008, 2009, 2010, there was an argument in the climate denial community that global average temperatures were no longer going up, that warming had stopped and it was called the hiatus. And that argument was based on a selective choice of data. That argument was based on choosing a certain subset of a larger set of data and drawing a conclusion that they chose to draw based not on the evidence, but on their perception and their preference. So I show this, 1880 to 2018, you could see there was that little tiny down curve from one year to another year, but the long-term trend has continued to go up and up and up, and this is global climate change. But even this data, even this set of data, is not all of the data that we have on temperatures and climate of the Earth. This is the same record for 2,000 years, not 120 years, for 2,000 years based on paleoclimate data, showing variations in temperature over time. And then at the very end here on the right of the graph, the instrumental record going way up and up and up, suggesting that we are really outside of the natural variability of climate. And this is, again, part of the argument that climate scientists use to say that not only do we understand what's going on, but this is outside of the norm of what we understand the climate of the Earth to be. But even this isn't the full data set. This is a data set that goes back 800,000 years based on ice core reconstructions, other paleoclimatic reconstructions, and it shows, again, a lot of different things. So we have 800,000 years on the left and the modern day on the right, so zero is today, and it shows ups and downs of climate. Actually, this shows concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, but the temperature uh, graph is the same. It shows ups and downs, and we understand that uh, carbon dioxide fluctuates naturally, the climate of the Earth fluctuates naturally over time for reasons that, again, we understand very well that have to do with orbital dynamics and the output of the sun and, and the tilt of the axis of the Earth, which changes over time. Those drive natural changes in climate. And when CO2 is high, we're in what's called an interglacial, and the Earth is relatively warm, and when CO2 is low, we're in an ice age, and it's cold, and we're now up at 400 parts per million, which the Earth hasn't seen for 800,000 years, or actually two to three million years. And again, this is the human influence on climate. So cherry picking gives you the wrong 
answer sometimes, and it's often used as a technique to misrepresent science. So another example about uh, cherry picking in the context of Arctic ice, uh, the president of the Heartland Institute in 2011 wrote an op-ed in, in the Santa Fe New Mexican newspaper in which he said, quote, National Snow and Ice Data Center records, and for those of you who don't know, the National Snow and Ice Data Center is where we keep and track information on snow and ice at the federal level, show conclusively that in April 2009, Arctic sea ice extent had indeed returned to and surpassed 1989 levels, end of quote. Now, this argument that he was making was also in, partly in the context of this hiatus, the global warming is over, or has stopped, or isn't real. And what he's arguing is that, look, sea ice in April of 2009 is higher than it was in April of 1989, 20 years earlier. So, therefore, climate change isn't real. So for those of us in the climate science community, we thought, well, okay, what, what's really going on here? We consider ourselves skeptics, real skeptics, and a real skeptic will look at the data. So I did. And there's a, I published a post on this at Huffington Post, which you can look at later, but here's the story. So this is a graph that shows on a monthly basis two different years of Arctic sea ice. 1989 and 2009 by month, January through December. And uh, 1989 is the blue line, 2009 is the red line, and April 2009 is that circled spot right there. So, first of all, he's absolutely correct. In April 2009, Arctic sea ice was higher than it was in April of 1989. But this is cherry picking. As you can see, Arctic sea ice in 2009, for the entire year, except April really, was below what it was in 1989 because Arctic sea ice is disappearing. Now, it's 2019, it's 10 years later now. Here's the graph for 2018, because we don't have 2019 yet. Arctic sea ice has continued to decline as those of you who read the newspaper or whatever you read, uh, understand. Arctic sea ice especially is disappearing at a very, very rapid rate. And of course, this is only one way to look at it. This is Arctic sea ice extent from 1979 when we first started really detailed satellite records up until basically a few weeks ago, May 2019. And it shows Arctic sea ice goes up and down, but the long-term trend is the dissolution, the disappearance of Arctic sea ice. Now, I could cherry pick this too. I could, you know, you could pick a low, a low graph. And anyway, you, you get the point. So my argument here is that being skeptical really requires looking at all of the data. In addition, I think as we know, climate change is more than warming. It's not just temperature. It's not just sea ice. We also have experienced, as we know, the hottest three decades on record over the last three decades. We know that ice sheets in glaciers and the ice mass in Greenland and the Arctic sea ice are disappearing at an accelerating rate. We know that permafrost is receding. We know that extreme weather events are increasing in number and severity. We know that sea level rise is going up and accelerating. We know that oceans are getting warmer and becoming more acidic. We know that birds and butterflies are migrating earlier. We know that flowers are blooming earlier and plants are photosynthesizing earlier. We know that pests range are expanding. So from every aspect of natural science, we see the evidence of climate change. It's not just a temperature hiatus or a, a month with more sea ice than it used to be. It's, it's a whole suite of evidence. And what scientists and skeptics do, what we do is look at the full range of evidence. And believe me, if, if a scientist could come up with an alternative explanation for all of the things we're observing, for all of the things we understand about physical law, for all of the things that our models tell us that explained away climate change, that scientist would be famous. I mean, that's what Galileo did. Galileo took observations, 
and argued against the consensus of the time that happened to be wrong at the time. And he paid a personal p penalty for it, uh, but that's what skeptics do. Misuse of uncertainty. So this is another important issue. So what does uncertainty mean to you? So for the public, the word uncertainty often means uh, you don't know the answer. You're uncertain. You, you, you just don't know. For a scientist, the word uncertainty is a range around a data point to indicate the accuracy of an estimate or a measurement. So you, you make an estimate and there's a range of uncertainty around that and, and that bounds what we know and what we don't know. So here's a quote from uh, the Dice Play God this year. The future is uncertain, but the science of uncertainty is the science of the future. The future is uncertain, but that doesn't mean that we don't know things. The science of uncertainty is the science of the future, and accepting uncertainty is necessary to understanding how the world works. But science and scientists often find that uncertainty is misused. So here's a, a quote from a 2002 memo by, by uh, Frank Luntz, who is a Republican consultant. Quote, should the public come to believe that the scientific issues are settled, their views about global warming will change accordingly. And this was his recommendation. Therefore, you need to continue to make the lack of scientific certainty a primary issue in the debate about climate science. And that recommendation was adopted wholeheartedly. And uncertainty and the, the fact that a scientist can not or won't typically say, I'm absolutely certain about something, has led to the misuse of uncertainty in policy debates. And here's a good example from a few weeks ago. I'm on Twitter all the time, so this is an example from Twitter. Uh, this guy, Mike Bastich, is a meteorologist. Uh, has some meteorology training or not? Uh, John? Yeah, anyway. He says, ask any, this is his tweet, ask any scientist, they will tell you modeling out decades is fraught with uncertainty and confounding variables. So let me stop there for a second. I should have covered it up. Because that statement is true. That statement is true. Ask any scientist and they will tell you, the honest scientist, that modeling out decades is fraught with uncertainty and confounding variables. But his next sentence is false. Basically, it's not reliable. He's saying, because there's uncertainty, do not trust models, do not trust climate scientists. And that's this making uncertainty, this, that's this abuse of uncertainty in the scientific debate. And he and I went back and forth on this issue on Twitter. Also, I circled, for those of you, again, who aren't Twitter, there, there are three things at the bottom of each tweet. One is comments, the other is retweets, and the other is likes. That's the, the little comment box is, is uh, comments, the one in the middle is retweets, and the heart is if you like something. And when a, Twitter, when a tweet gets more comments than retweets or more comments than likes, it's called ratioed. And what, when your tweet is ratioed in the social science world, that suggests there's something wrong with your tweet. It means that people have a lot to say about what you just tweeted, and it's typically not very good. <laughs> now, this issue was hugely important in the tobacco debate. The question is, at what point does science become sufficient for policymaking in general? And for tobacco and cancer, this issue of uncertainty was front and center in the debate about tobacco. So in 1982, the Surgeon General of the United States, after many previous years of good science and discussion about this said, quote, cigarette smoking is the chief single avoidable cause of death in our society and the most important public health issue of our time. 1982. And yet, for the tobacco industry, it was important that they make the argument that that wasn't right, that the science was wrong. And it was an argument from ideology 
In this case, the ideology could be capitalism or profit centers or uh, whatever, wanting to sell more tobacco. And one of the tools they used was the misuse of uncertainty and the misuse of facts. And in 1996, 14 years later, I believe this was testimony in front of Congress, uh, the tobacco industry, the Tobacco Institute said, quote, we don't believe it's ever been established that smoking is a cause of disease. And the CEO of Philip Morris in 1996 said, I'm unclear in my own mind whether anyone dies of cigarette smoking related diseases. And Mike Pence in the year 2000 said, despite the hysteria from the political class and the media, smoking doesn't kill. In fact, two out of every three smokers does not die from a smoking-related illness. <laughs> and nine out of ten smokers do not contract lung cancer. So, I... All right, so I'm glad you laughed at that, because I, I didn't want to have to point out that, that in this statement alone, the, the contradictions are mind-blowing. Smoking doesn't kill. And then in the next sentence, okay, it kills one-third of the people who smoke. <laughs> That's, that's just a small number. And nine out of 10 doesn't contract lung cancer. I mean, the, the twists of logic and the misuse of uncertainty and the abuse of science, it's rife in some of these really important public policy debates. These are important debates for public policy, for health, for environmental issues. And it's important that we understand and be able to read as you, a perfect audience of true skeptics, are able to read these kinds of statements. And I just want to repeat, these earlier statements from the tobacco industry were 14 years after the Surgeon General made that very clear sentence, uh, statement about the health effects of tobacco. So a few other aspects of science policy misconduct. There's biased or distorted science education in schools, packing or eliminating advisory boards at, at federal level or the state level, imposing litmus tests on scientists before they can participate in something, Suppressing information, bullying of scientists, Galileo and the church, misplaced congressional hearings. Uh, the Virginia Attorney General a number of years ago filed a suit against one of, uh, one of the, uh, uh, Michael Mann, a climate scientist and a good friend and colleague. And then there are a series of new social media challenges. And I'll talk again about a few of these. So biased or distorted science education in schools. Uh, is an important one to me. Uh, my wife is an educator, a science educator. Uh, many of you probably are as well. And I'm a believer, as was Thomas Jefferson, in democracy and when people don't understand something in education. And I don't have the Thomas Jefferson quote for you. Um, but uh, as we know, even today, uh, as the National Center for Science Education, where's, where's Jeannie, uh, National Center for Science Education pointed out, quote, state lawmakers from Connecticut to Florida are proposing measures that some groups say could threaten how science and climate change are taught in the classroom. More than a dozen such bills have popped up this year, pushing back against the broad scientific consensus that people are warming the planet. And we saw this for the, the evolution debate. We see this for a lot of critical debates around education. Uh, the effort to reach young people with misinformation is a very dangerous and uh, pernicious, pernicious uh, uh, act. Uh, we have political and ideological bullying of scientists. Uh, this is actually a, a magnet on my refrigerator at home. Um, and, and it's from, well, you know what it's from. But a classic example, Galileo. Uh, Galileo, this is a letter that was written by Cardinal Bellarmine in the name of Pope Paul V in uh, the early, late 1590s, I guess it was. Galileo's order to quote, <laughs> quote, it's, I admit, a translation from the Italian, uh, relinquish altogether the said opinion, namely, that the sun is the center of the universe and immovable and that the earth moves, nor henceforth to hold, teach, or defend it any way, either verbally or in writing. And Galileo was sentenced to house arrest for the rest of his life for this. Some social media uh, issues, just some terms you might want to be, be conversant with in order to deal with your children. 
uh, sea lioning, the Dunning-Kruger effect, gish galloping, and false balance. So sea lioning is the idea of pretending to ask on social media sincere questions, but persistently feigning ignorance and repeating polite follow-ups until someone, typically a very patient scientist at the other end, gets fed up and disappears from the argument or says, I, I, I'm not going to answer any more of your questions. You're not, you're, not respond, you're not listening. And then attacking that scientist as uh, being unreasonable and unwilling to debate. That's sea lining. The Dunning-Kruger effect. In the field of psychology, this uh, refers to when people mistakenly assess their cognitive ability as greater than it really is. The inability of people to recognize their lack of ability or objectively evaluate their competence or incompetence. And there are lots of examples of the Dunning-Kruger effect. Uh, I won't give you an example. <laughs> Gish galloping, a technique used during debate that focuses on overwhelming an opponent with a, a rapid series of specious arguments or half-truths or misrepresentations in a short period of time, which makes it impossible for the opponent to refute all of them within the format of a formal debate. And I have to note this term was coined uh, by our very own Jeannie Scott. So gish galloping, somebody makes an argument on the internet and a scientist responds saying, look, that, that's not right. This is really what's going on. And the response to that is, but what about this other argument? And you try to respond to that. And they, well, what about this other argument? So they never acknowledge that you're responding, first of all, to their first false argument. They just overwhelm you with misrepresentations and half-truths, and the argument goes nowhere. That's gish galloping. And false balance. You can't read this, but I'll read it for you. It's a, it's a classic TV format. And we'll be talking today with Dr. Jenkins of the National Institute of Health about the results of his three-year study. And then for a different take, We'll talk to Roger here, who I understand has reached the opposite conclusion just by sitting on his couch and speculating. <laughs> and so we see false balance a lot in the media these days, where uh, if, we're, if we're lucky enough to see a scientist on national TV, there will then be a rebuttal by Roger, who reached the opposite conclusion, sitting on his couch and speculating. That's false balance. The idea that every argument has a pro and a con. It's a challenge for media these days to deal with that kind of, of false balance. Uh, reporters like to report on multiple sides of an argument. But sometimes there's one side of an argument and then there's somebody being wrong. And false balance misrepresents that balance in an uneven way. And the 97% consensus in climate scientists, or 98 or 99, is a good example of that. You'll get a climate scientist and then there are people who are on the other side who are willing to to talk about that, but they misrepresent the nature of the balance of what we understand. And here's another example. Welcome to Science Hell, Professor. This is Tony. He once saw something on the internet about your field of expertise and is going to spend eternity lecturing you on it. <laughs> and admittedly, most of us who think about the future, for those of you who haven't read Dante's Inferno in the last few years, in the eighth circle of hell in Dante's Inferno, which is way down there toward the devil, are prognosticators and forecasters and fortune tellers and presumably climate scientists and economic modelers. <laughs> and Tony. So moving forward on the integrity of science. The scientific community, and I would argue the public, needs to be aware of internal problems and we need to fix them. Real skepticism must be encouraged. Science is often wrong. Scientists make mistakes. And hopefully we understand that. But we need to be aware of internal problems in the scientific community that are often associated with logical fallacies, when we make mistakes, when we make error, errors, when we misinterpret things. And we in the scientific community need to be aware of that and acknowledge that. Scientists and the public must resist efforts to misuse science or to intimidate scientists that produce results not consistent with some particular ideology. Scientists and scientific organizations must be able and willing to speak out against pseudo-skepticism, false 
skepticism and the abuse of science. Funding must be transparent. Funding is a challenge in science. Um, sometimes funding influences science. It shouldn't. Uh, what, wherever your source of funding, you should do science that's independent of the perspective of your funder. That's not the point of science. And bad science will be discovered eventually. Uh, but funding ought to be transparent. And that's true in science. And frankly, it's increasingly extraordinarily true in politics as well. But funding should be transparent. Governmental and academic policies must ensure the independence of science research and advising. The more all of us understand about logical fallacies and other kinds of abuses of science, the better able we are to argue logically and fairly and productively. We need to be better at addressing the flaws of social media and the ability of social media to spread bad science. There's lots of great scientists on social media, but Social media, as I think we all know, uh, is not a perfect venue for sharing information. And we need to be aware of that, and we need to be, understand the ability of social media to spread bad science, and we need to be able to push back against that. Finally, I argue we must continue to push for the use of science in policymaking and against the assault of science, uh, assault on science. As I said at the beginning, uh, Good policy requires good science. Good policy making requires the willingness and ability of those who are in a position of making policy to listen to and absorb and understand good science and to understand bad science when it's presented to them. That's a challenge. It's a, 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 one of the most important challenges of our day. And I urge us all to continue to push for good science and for the ability of us to use good science in policy making. Thank you very much. We do have a few minutes for questions. Uh, so the way this is gonna work today, if you are near the back of the room, please go up to that microphone stand that is there in the middle of the aisle. If you're in the front and I can easily get the microphone to you, I will walk to you and give you the microphone. Um, reminder, please ask questions. Keep them concise and brief. If you have a long question, you are preventing other folks from asking their question. So, without further ado, okay, it looks like people are up in the front. I saw this first, so we'll start over here. You brought up Twitter, and of course we live in the age of social media. I'm literally live tweeting you uh, as we speak to my audience, who's very science and space literate in particular. Do you think that's made it easier for you to communicate, or is it making it harder? Should we get off Twitter? Oh, so uh, I'm a huge fan of Twitter. I love Twitter. Um, I think it's made it much easier for me to reach out to a much broader community. I'm now engaged with people I would never have met otherwise. Um, it's a challenge. Uh, there's a very strong climate science community on Twitter. Uh, we're very supportive of each other. Uh, there is, as you might imagine, a fairly loud climate denial community on Twitter. Um, and so that's something that all of us have to deal with. Twitter has the ability to block people um, which means you can't see their tweets and they can't see your tweets. And for really unpleasant people, that's a useful tool on Twitter to make my Twitter stream a little more manageable. It also lets you mute people, so you can't, they can still hear you, but you can't hear them. Um, that's, that's a useful tool as well. Um, uh, I'm on Twitter too much. <laughs> I, I'm not saying it's a perfect tool, but, but without a doubt, it's let me reach a, a, broader, a broader audience. Having said that, two and a half years ago, I deleted my Facebook account. I'm not on Facebook. I have challenges that I can't deal with with the company and their policies about privacy and so on. So social media, is a, it's a complex dynamic. Okay, we'll go to the microphone stand next. Yes, uh, I wonder if I could, um, is the mic on? 
No. Yeah. Oh. All right, just speak up. Oh, okay. There we go. Okay. Uh, I wonder if I could get you uh, to tone down the attack on the Catholic Church a little bit. Uh, historians like uh, Lawrence Principe uh, have pointed out that uh, the Pope came down on Galileo not so much because of the heliocentric model, which many clergy accepted at the time, but because he, he characterized the uh, simpleton in his dialogues as being a total idiot, and everybody understood that the simpleton represented the Pope. Okay, thank you. Um, so I, I don't think I was particularly hard on the Catholic Church. Uh, and I, we won't get into a de debate about interpreting what the Catholic Church thought about Galileo. I will note, um, I have been to a series over the last few years of meetings at the Pontifical Academy of Sciences. There is an Academy of Sciences at, at, at the Vatican where uh, there has been one series of meetings after another, superb meetings, about climate science, about evolution, about science and public policy, about science and spirituality, uh, meetings that have just been fantastic. Um, so, thank you. So, since you're talking about abuse of science in uh, uh, public policy, uh, maybe you want to comment a little bit on uh, the recent events with Will Happer? Yeah, so um, this is sort of a, a, an example of the time. Uh, obviously, we have a president at the moment who is not interested in science or understanding of science. Um, he has made comments disparaging climate science in particular. Um, he actually has a science advisor at the Office of Science and Technology and Policy, but, but it's not clear to me he's ever met with that person. Um, but he has also adopted someone named Will Happer, who is uh, a physicist from Princeton, who has done some very good physics in his time, but is a climate denier. And, and uh, intent is always hard to understand. I, I don't know Will Happer's intent, what he, under, what he really understands or doesn't understand about climate science, but, but he apparently is the closest advisor to the president at the moment about climate science. Um, and in the last week has been implicated in um, the, the White House, uh, the White House censored the testimony of a State Department official at a hearing last week on climate science, refused to let him submit written testimony. And just in the last day or two, it's turned out that Will Happer from Princeton um, took this, this State Department official's testimony about climate science and marked it up and said, this is bad science. And, uh, and anyway, basically censored that very good scientific testimony. So we, at the moment, we have at the highest levels of power in the United States uh, very serious climate deniers who are misrepresenting science to the highest levels of government. And I only hope that it, this is a temporary thing, but it's a dangerous thing. And as, again, I suspect most of you know, we're already way behind the eight ball on dealing with climate change, and this is going to delay us even further. This, this is the last question. All of these presentations are recorded, so this will be available later after the event. There are a number of terms, it seems, that are different, uh, that, that uh, the world in general interprets um, differently than scientists, and, and um, uncertainty, as you brought up, was one of them. Wouldn't it be easier for scientists to start using a different term for that thing than to convince millions and millions and millions of people that their way of thinking about it is not correct. Yes, okay, so that's a wonderful point. Um, in fact, the, the climate science communications community has developed a list of terms exactly like this. Uncertainty is one of them and what it means to scientists and what it means to everybody else. And your point is exactly right. And, and we have this conversation in science communication a lot it's hard to get scientists to, to communicate, period. Uh, we're often not given credit for it at our, our organizations. We're often not trained in communication. We're often not good at it. Th that's a challenge. And to get a scientist to change some of the terms that they're familiar with using when they talk to their scientific colleagues, when they talk to the public, it's a challenge. Um, some are better at it than others. 
But but I, I, I agree completely with your point, which is rather than try and explain to the general public what what a scientist means by uncertainty, a scientist should use a different term, um, and that would help communication. All right, if we could thank Dr. Glick thank again. Thank you very much. <laughs>